Welcome to Meekum Presents On The Move, brought to you by State Farm. It's the show geared toward keeping you up to speed with the latest auto news, event coverage, and expert industry insight. Now, here are your hosts, Matt Avery and John Craman. Hey, and welcome everyone to another episode of On The Move. I'm Matt Avery, executive producer of The Transmission, and joining me is my co-host, John Craman, lead TV commentator for Mika Auctions. John, how are you doing today? I am doing great, Matt, and I have to tell you that I'm really excited about the format to today's show, uh, where all of us are getting antsy and anxious to get going back, and not only in the auction world, but also with auto racing. We did see Darlington uh, kick off uh, to a great race with empty stands, uh, not a bad way to get things going but uh we're gonna definitely have an indianapolis 500 theme today so this is gonna be really cool yeah first up we'll hear from sage Karam, professional race car driver about what he's been up to recently including his experience with e-racing and then we're also going to spend some time with scott hoke scott will be a, a familiar name and face to many listeners as the longtime tv host for mecham auctions but scott has some very close ties to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. So we'll hear all about those and a whole lot more. John, before we get to those special guests, what's the latest with the upcoming Mecham Indianapolis auction? Yeah, good tie in there, Matt. Uh, just had a conversation both with Dana and Frank Meekham yesterday and consignments are flooding in. Keep in mind the dates have been revised now to July 10th through the 18th. Uh, some really breaking news in the next week or two will be some not only some good individual high profile main attraction consignments, but also some big collections and you and I will be talking about those over the next two or three weeks. John, looking to the new car industry, Ford made the announcement that later this summer, they're going to be phasing out their Fusion, the, the midsize sedan that they've offered for a number of years now. It's kind of a big deal for a number of reasons. And I wanted to see what are your thoughts on a, a move like this? Yeah, it kind of surprised me in a way, although we knew it was coming, Matt. Uh, the announcement now has been that July of 2020, the Ford Fusion will go out of production, making the only passenger car available from Ford Motor Company as the Mustang. And it kind of hits close to home uh, in a couple of different ways. I remember in 2013, when I saw the first redesigned Fusion coming at me with that definite Aston Martin front end on it, very sleek style, uh, I'd spun my head around and it captivated me to the point when in 2015, Christine and I needed a new car for her. And we went, we bought a brand new 2015 Ford 15, uh, a Ford Fusion trading in her 2006 Ford Fusion that she had bought new. So both were fantastic cars. We still have her 15 Fusion and I'm really glad we do. It's great color and low miles. So uh, kind of sad to see that part of, of, of automotive history fading away. It was so strange five, six years ago, the mid-size sedan market was one of the hottest segments going. And of course, as we know, as we've talked about even on this show, sedans one by one are starting to go in the distance and SUVs and crossovers are gaining steam. Now with Fusion soon out of the picture, John, what does that leave shoppers that are looking in that segment? Yeah, it looks like the only midsize uh, American branded sedan that will be left on the market will be the Chevy Malibu, uh, a direct competitor for the Fusion. Certainly no shortage of competition out there for the Asian manufacturers, uh, Toyota with the Camry, Honda with the Accord, uh, Hyundai with the Sonata, just to name a few. Uh, interesting to see exactly where the Asian manufacturers sort of uh, follow the lead or continue to have that market pretty much to themselves. Well, John, as Fusion goes away, we've got the return of another nameplate from a couple years ago with Toyota announcing that Venza would be making a, a reappearance this summer, but this time on a CUV. Yeah, and the Venza was always kind of a high-styled, sort of a tall station wagon with kind of a sleek look. I went away in 2015, and it, I, I, I guess once again, the changing world, Matt, I'm not surprised that they're bringing back that nameplate, but they're bringing it back in a platform configuration that's that's a little bit unique that may show what the future is heading. It'll be a hybrid only and all-wheel drive. What do you think of that? I think that's a sign of things to come where all other automakers will probably follow suit and doing the same thing. It doesn't seem that long ago when I remember that a hybrid powertrain or even all wheel drive was a premium option on models and, and even ones that people weren't too keen on. But as the technology has advanced and the cost has come down and people see the benefits. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. Have it as a standard equipment. 
Well, performance enthusiasts from the Toyota line are going to be pleased to hear that the Toyota Supra for the 2021 model years got a bump in standard power of the six-cylinder engine, but also a new model, a four-cylinder, Turbo 4. First time ever that a four-cylinder engine used in the Supra lineup. And uh, we'll be hearing more and more about that as, as the year progresses. But early reports are very favorable for the lower-cost four-cylinder entry-level Supra from some of the testers that I've read. They like the balance of the car they like the responsiveness and of course the low price helps too so lots going out there in the automotive world we'll we'll keep everybody informed on latest news Mecham auctions is proud to bring you on the move with matt avery and john Craman. for more on the world of collector cars head over to Meekum.com. now let's get back to the show with the return of summer, things are heating up in the world of racing. And for the inside scoop, we've got professional race car driver Sage Karam on the line. Sage, thanks so much for stopping by. Hey, thanks you guys for having me. Sage, before we get going, give us some background on your career. How did you get started in racing? When I was about four years old, my parents bought a house in Nazareth, Pennsylvania, um, which is home of the Andretti's. So, um, you know, I, it, it was pretty much racing was was the one huge thing that Nazareth had going for it and, and with the Andretti name and the, you know, living there. So my dad actually became really good friends with Michael um, when he was racing full time and um, he was his fitness trainer as well. Um, so a lot of my childhood was spent up at the Andretti house. And then, you know, since Michael was racing full time, he didn't really have, um, you know, the time to be able to take Marco racing. So, you know, he asked my dad, um, if uh, my dad could take Marco up to New York and, um, you know, we could go race and, and, and I would just tag along. And that's kind of how I got started into it. So I raced up there from four to eight years old. Um, and then once, you know, we started winning at, at the local track nearly, you know, all the time, you know, we wanted to take the next step as far as finding the next level of competition. And that was, you know, racing all over the country, racing nationally. Um, so from like eight to 12, I, I uh, raced go-karts basically every other weekend. It felt like, um, you know, in national series all over the country. Um, and we became pretty successful at that. And then that's when I, after that, made the, the jump into Skip Barber. Uh, did that for a few seasons. And then I, I did the uh, Road to Indy program. And I did a lot of those years with Andretti Autosport. And then I went to Schmidt-Peterson Motorsports um, for Indy Lights. And I won the championship in that um, the first year. And then after that, I, I signed with, um, Chip Ganassi is a driver developmental deal that was in 2014 and that's when I made my first Indy 500 appearance and uh, you know I don't think it would have I would have had it if we didn't live in Nazareth and we didn't know the Andretti so I credit a lot of my career getting going and everything to them. Sage, something that people are talking about recently and that you've been competing in is iRacing. Tell us how did you get started in that? Basically, I started iRacing in 07. Um, you know, it was a new service that was coming out. And, um, you know, I was making the jump from go-karts to cars. So that was something that was, was appealing to me because I didn't really know how to drive a race car. I only knew go-karts. And, you know, I've never even um, drove a, a go-kart that had gears or anything like that. So I had to learn, you know, how to drive, um, you know, an H pattern, stuff like that. So my first, you know, couple laps or, you know, learning how to do all that stuff was on iRacing. You know, thankfully they had um, the Skip Barber car and, and Sebring, which was going to be where I was going to, you know, drive for the first time. Um, so I was able to practice on that and, you know, it, it helped me out quite a bit. So I've been, you know, doing it ever since then. Cause I, you know, I found out how well that actually did help me. And um, yeah, we still do it to this day. And, you know, it's something we do um, as competitive. It's something we do for fun and it's something we do for, you know, training as well. And briefly fill us in, Sage, what kind of equipment do you use for that? Yeah, so right now my current equipment is I, I have an 80-20 aluminum profile rig. Um, it's a Husqvarna GT rig. And then I have a Husqvarna Ultimate pedals. I have um, a VRS direct drive steering wheel. And I have three 27-inch um, uh, monitors that I use um, for my visuals. And then I have a fourth monitor above it for all my fuel calculations, timing and scoring, um, stuff like that. And then my computer computer is basically, um, you know, I, I built it from scratch, um, this winter, um, you know, it's a uh, pretty, you know, high quality stuff I put into it just so I could future proof it with, you know, advances in technology and stuff. Usually, you know, after a year or two things start to slow down. So, um, you know, I decided to go all 
all in on my computer so I could, um, you know, use it at, at maximum graphics and stuff for the next few years. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's, I started out with not anything like I have now. And, you know, that's the cool thing about sim racing is, you know, you can get into it on any level you want. And depending on how much you want to spend or, or you know, how little you want to spend, you can race some really cool guys and you can be competitive and win some races and, and have a lot of fun. And how does it compare to actually being behind the wheel? Um, it, it does a pretty good job. You know, I think, um, there's obviously some things that, um, you're not going to get in the sim that you get in real life. You know, like in real life, we feel a lot of details, um, just like through our bodies, you know, like when, when we're driving, you know, we're feeling the car bottom out through our butts and, and, um, you know, we're feeling all of these little, um, you know, all, all these little, um, details through our hands and the steering wheel. Um, and with the sim, I feel like you don't get all those little details. Um, you need a much bigger detail, um, you know, before your, your brain and, and your body knows what's about to happen. Whereas in real life, you have all these little things that are, are accumulating and, and you're like, all right, it's about to slide. Um, so you need a much bigger detail for that to happen. Um, but as far as like how the cars handle and react and drive, um, it's, it's pretty good. Um, you know, obviously I think it's not perfect, but you know, it's definitely getting better. And I think every year the strides that sim racing makes, you know, to getting more realistic is, is, is really nice. And the tracks I think are the best thing on the, on the sim side. It's, um, you know, they laser scan all the tracks. So basically every bump and, in, in you know, crevice in the road, um, you know, is, is, is there in real life as it is in the sim. Um, you know, the tracks seem really legit. Um, I've learned probably every track I went to, uh, mostly every track I've went to, um, on the sim before I went there. And, and I could say, you know, that has been a really big saving grace for me. That's for sure. Sage, you talked about the hardware in your computer setup, but let's transition and talk about the hardware in your actual race car. What can you tell us about your vehicle and its capabilities? Yeah, so we, um, you know, we run a Delara um, IndyCar IR18. Um, you know, it's powered by a Chevy engine. It's about 700 horsepower, um, give or take. You know, they between the road, we get more horsepower on the road courses than we do on the ovals, and then we'll get some more boost, you know, on qualifying day on the ovals and stuff like that. Um, and you know, they, they, uh, I think they're only around like 1500 pounds with driver. So they're quite light. Um, so 700 horsepower with that weight is, is pretty astonishing. Um, you know, at, at the Indianapolis motor speedway, um, you know, we can do laps over 230 uh, miles an hour average. So going into turn one and qualifying trim and stuff, uh, you know, sometimes you're, you're up over 240. Um, so it's pretty insane how fast they are. And, you know, the technology, the aerodynamics involved in the car is, um, quite impressive. Um, you know, it's, uh, you, you don't think the car is going to stick when you go into that corner at 230, 35 and, um, you know, it does it and, you know, you need to, sometimes it's hard, you know, when, when you're out of the car for so long and you hop back in it, you know, to trust it again. Um, but once you do it once and, and you get that trust back with it, it's a pretty amazing feeling. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, we have so many options we can do inside the car with the steering wheel. Um, you know, we can change the crossway with, with the weight jacker and stuff. And, um, we have the front and rear roll bar settings we can do, which, you know, basically soften or stiffen the front and the rear of the car to help handling. Um, you know, we can change the brake bias and, and we have all these things we can see on our dash, you know, just the steering wheels alone. Um, you know, I think you could buy like three to five simulators with how much of just a single steering wheel calls in the real car. So, um, it's a pretty advanced, uh, piece of machinery that's for sure sage with the indianapolis 500 this year being pushed back to august 23rd when will you start really preparing heavily for the race do you know what your schedule is going to be yet yeah i mean it's um you know it's it's definitely a weird you know situation for sure you know we're used to going there in may um you know i think right now i'd be um you know gearing up for the race uh, you know the race would be coming up for us so um it, it is weird being home in pennsylvania in in may i'm not used to that so um you know i i think during this quarantine and stuff we've we've still been doing our absolute best to you know keep our training regimen um you know in tip-top shape um you know i obviously the gym i trained at has had to been shut down so 
Um, I've just been going over to my parents' house and my dad has got a couple weights in the basement and, you know, we've just been doing that. It's nothing fancy, but you know, it gets the job done. Um, so I'll be training just as hard now as I would be, um, you know, leading up to if it was in May. Um, so I'll be training every day and, and, and ready to go. And, um, you know, I think the team, we were wanting to do, you know, like a five or six race schedule this year and we were supposed to do St. Pete and, you know, I was ready to go down there and we, you know, we fly down there and the next day, once we're there, uh, you know, they basically say the race was canceled. So, um, you know, we were pretty bummed out, but we were ready to go. Um, so, you know, that being said, you know, I know the teams want to get back into some more races. So hopefully we can, uh, you know, pick up some more races because I think some of the ones we wanted to do have now been canceled. Um, so hopefully we can replace those with some other ones. Um, so, you know, I need to be training as if, you know, I'm going to be in the car in, in a week or so, um, because you never know, you know, when we're going to be able to decide to, to go do a race, you know, hopefully we can get a race or two before the 500, but if not, you know, I'll be ready for Indy and, and anything after that. Give us some insight, Sage, into the experience of actually being behind the wheel when you pull out onto a racetrack and you've got competitors around you with engines rumbling and crowds are cheering. What's that like? Yeah, so race day at the 500 is unlike anything. It's um, it's pretty it's pretty amazing. You know, you're you're, you're practicing all month of May, and you know the the stands are gray. Um, you know, there's not many people there. You know, you get people in the garage and stuff, and a couple people sitting on the front straight um, stand. But, you know, for the most part, it's pretty quiet. Um, and then you show up race day and you get over 300,000 people. Um, it's quite impressive. You know, you, you, you get, you know, you do all your pre-race activities and stuff and, and, you know, all the stuff they do there is, is incredible. And, you know, that leads to some butterflies for sure. And, you know, just getting ready to, to strap into the, to your car. And once you're in there, you know, I feel like that's when you're most nervous is, um, when you finally put the helmet on, you strap in. Um, and then once the engine starts, I feel like all the nerves go away and, you know, you're ready to go. And, you know, I've always, one of my most favorite memories I'll always have. And, and, you know, that I look forward to every single year is the, you know, the warm up laps we do, cause you can take that time to, you know, really just take in what you're about to do. And, you know, you drive around the speedway and, you know, it's gone from gray to a bunch of different colors and, you know, packed house. You can't see a place to sit or stand. It's, it's quite incredible. And, um, it's actually kind of, um, like, like weird at first because, you know, you're not used to this. So it actually looks like the stands are, are moving like a wave, um, because there is so much movement that you're not used to seeing. So you have to like get adjusted to it while you're driving around for the warm up laps. And you actually don't want to look into them so much cause it can be like a little bit screwy, but, um, you know, you can't help to not look at it. So, um, you know, and then once you get going, it just feels like any other race, you know, but it's the biggest race. So it's, you know, you, you want to do well. And, and if things don't go well, then, um, you know, it hurts because, you know, you got to wait, you know, 365 days until you get another shot at it and get it. Cause it's not another race, you know, that's like it. A Sage road courses versus the oval tracks, any preference comparing the two? Um, you know, I think, you know, they, they both have their, um, you know, reasons of, of difficulties and, and stuff like that. In my opinion, I think the ovals are harder just because, um, there's so much more on edge and, um, there's really no leeway. I mean, if you get loose, you're, you're usually not going to be able to catch it and you're going to crash. Um, and then if you do crash on an oval, you know, you're going much faster. So they hurt a bit more, that's for sure. Um, but you know, I, I personally, I feel like I do better on the ovals. Um, but I do enjoy driving like the street circuits and the road courses a little bit more. Um, but it's hard for me to say I like that more because like I said, I do better on the ovals in my opinion. So you usually like what you're, what you do well at. Um, you know, I have ovals that I don't like to drive and I have road courses that I don't like to drive. Um, you know, it goes both ways, but, um, you know, for the most part, I think, um, in my history, I've done better on the ovals than the road courses. Sage, when you slow things down and you get out of your race car, what kind of cars and trucks are you getting into for just uh, every day around town driving? You know, I've had quite a few in my days. I, I, you know, I just traded in my BMW M4 for a BMW X4. Um, you know, I just wanted an SUV and, you know, growing up next to the Andretti's, I got to see some pretty cool cars that they used to, you know, drive and, you know, Mario has and, and Michael and Al Marco. Um, so I've seen some cool cars, been around cool cars. Um, one of my long time sponsors, Michael Fuchs, 
um, he, he actually has one of the biggest car collections in the world and, and, um, you know, auctions a lot of the cars through Meekum. Um, and he virtually has no miles on these things. They're, they're pretty pristine. Um, so I've seen a lot of cool cars that he's had and he's let me drive a few of those. Um, and you know, after my first 500, he actually gifted me a, I think, I believe it's a 2006 Aston Martin Vantage, um, in Sage green and Sage green interior. So green on green. Um, so that's pretty special car I have. And, you know, I keep that in the garage and and don't put many miles on it. I do drive it. Um, but, uh, you know, only on nice days, I want to keep the miles low on it. And, um, you know, my grandfather has a 55 Chevy, um, um, that we, you know, we get to wrench on a little bit and work on. That's been fun. And, you know, hopefully down the road, if I can win Indy one day, I can maybe, you know, come to a Meekum auction and, and place a bid on, on an old Camaro or something. I think that would be awesome. Hey, Sage, we've just learned that once again, Meekum Auctions is going to be a part of your uh, sponsorship package at Indianapolis this year. You may or may not know that Dana Meekum, our company founder and president, is a huge Indy 500 uh, race fan, historian, and has a pretty impressive collection of vintage uh, Indy race cars. And uh, he was really delighted and proud to once again to be able to be have his name as part of your sponsorship sponsorship package who else do you see coming on board to help you guys out this year yeah i mean i um obviously i've i've had Meekum on the car now for quite a few years and you know they were a primary sponsor of mine too um uh the it was in 2017 i believe and we were i think that year we were running really well and that's when the alternator went we were inside the top 10 and we were right behind chato who, who ended up winning that day so um yeah it's, it's been a great partnership and really happy to have it and and you know dana's a, a great guy i've met him a few times now um you know because usually they have the indy uh indianapolis Meekum show going on um during the month of may so i've been able to swing over there a few times and they actually let me hit you know bring the hammer down on one of the bids um and so that was fun you know I, that's been a kind of a bucket list thing you know you, you, you always like watch on tv and you're like oh i would love to slam the hammer with them like the deal and I got to do that one. So that was cool. Um, but yeah, we have Wick Sculptors coming back on board, which is, you know, they've been a, a, a big partner of ours now for a few years. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, the cool thing about dry and rambled racing is I think it's such a family atmosphere. So it's like, we have, um, some really good partners that have been at the team now for quite a long time. And, um, you know, it just, like I said, it's like a family and, and, you know, we, we count on these, these people to help us out every year and, and they do. And, you know, we just want to be able to, to repay them them and, and do our best on track and um you know hopefully come this august we can um you know get all those people in, in victory lane well we wish you the best of luck in that and i uh, just want to say thanks for stopping by and, and hanging out and we hope you and your family continue to stay safe and healthy and we hope you guys are out racing soon yeah thanks thank you guys for having me i hope uh you know we can get back to normality sooner than later and i hope that you know everybody stays safe and uh yeah see you guys soon don't adjust that dial. On the Move will be right back. Our program is proudly presented by Meekum Auctions, the world's largest collector car auctions. Now back to Matt and John. Keeping the racing theme going, our next guest has long ties to automotive competition, including the Indy 500, and he'll be very familiar to Meekum enthusiasts as we have TV host Scott Hoke joining us. Scott, thanks for stopping by. Hey, Matt. Hey, JK. Good to see you guys again. Kind of an odd way to get together. We never would have called this, uh, Scott, after uh, compl successfully completing our last auction on NBCSN. That, of course, would have been uh, Glendale back in March. But, boy, fast forward to today, and the world sure has changed. How have you been uh, surviving the shutdown there in Indiana? Well, it's interesting because I do, like a lot of people, I do a lot of work from home anyway, and a lot of uh, a lot of prep for the auctions. Uh, I have a studio. I'm in my studio uh, at home right now. I do a lot of other, you know, non meekum related things, corporate voiceovers and such. And so I'm I'm kind of used to working at home, and so it's not really a big deal. And actually, I enjoyed it when there was very very little traffic on the highways here around Indianapolis, and people 
just fly down the interstate, no problem at all. But you know, we've we've been fine. Um, uh, the kids are doing okay. My and J.K., you don't even know this, Matt. I, nobody knows this. But my daughter, uh, my second daughter, just had a little baby last weekend. So I'm a grandpa for the first time ever. Oh, so, my. Breaking news. Love yeah, it. Congratulations. News. Congratulations. Awesome. She had a little boy. Um, Judah Lincoln uh, is his name. And uh, we're just so happy. The thing is, though, we haven't been able to see him in person yet. And, you know, just waiting for that time and make sure everything is cool for a, for a newborn coming into this world in a, <laughs> in a crazy time. Scott, let's go back to 2008. I'm anxious to hear your record. You and I met for the very first time back then. Yeah. Uh, and uh, take us back there. We'll call it uh, kind of the road to Mecham. How did you get connected with Mecham? And now 13 years ago. Yeah, it's it's interesting because before, and I, I want to say it might have been earlier, it was probably 2007, now that I recall, I got a phone call from uh, Terry Lingner, who many of you race fans may know that name. Uh, he is still heavily involved with IndyCar uh, television production. He was one of the guys that was in at ESPN at the very beginning, produced and came up with the idea for uh, Saturday Night Thunder, Thursday Night Thunder, uh, short track racing. But Terry called me and he said, hey, I want you to do a voiceover for this this Meekum auction event that was going on in St. Charles, Illinois. Uh, and it, it, it could have been, and I don't recall specifically, but it could have been something to do with uh, the lead up to Bloomington Gold. Maybe it was St. Charles and Bloomington Gold that year in 2007. I don't remember. All I had to do was read about 30 seconds of copy, and, uh, and that was it. And I didn't think anything more about it. It's like I said earlier, it's what I do. It's some of the voiceover things that I do. So then jump ahead to 2008. I'm sitting in my living room uh, on a Friday night in March of 2008. And my phone rings. And it's Terry Lingner calling me again. This was totally a God story, uh, divine intervention, no doubt about it in my mind. But Terry calls me, and he's the type of guy that when you see his name on your caller ID, you do two things. Number one, you answer the phone. And number two, you say yes to whatever it is he has <laughs> uh, in store for you. And literally, and I have, I have told the story a hundred times if I've told it once, guys, all he said was, hey, Scott, what are you doing tomorrow night? I said, uh, well, what do you have? He said, well, I'd, I've got this car show that I'd like you to host. I said, okay, uh, well, I can't really do it tomorrow night because I've got a prior commitment. He said, what about next Saturday? I said, okay, I'm in. So before the, the commitment that I had the next evening, I went over to the fairgrounds to the chicken barn uh, and looked around and man, I was in awe. I, it, it was it was unbelievable to me that all these cars were in one place and, and they were gonna be for sale. And so I think that may have been the night that I met you briefly, John. I was only there for a short period of time, but then the very next Saturday um, was our first time on the air back on HD Theater and I think we did eight consecutive Saturday nights in March, April, and May, and we skipped Mother's Day. And I came in, I think, on the third, the third show, and I've only missed one show since, and that was when my daughter, who just had the baby, got married a couple years ago. Uh, so, uh, and then, you know, we, we all kind of uh, waited around from May of that year until later in 2008 to find out what was going to happen in terms of this this show and then you know we kicked it off in earnest in Kissimmee in 2009 and haven't looked back well, hard to believe it's been probably a couple thousand hours of you and I sitting side by side over the past 13 years, 
calling the action on so yeah. many great auctions, so many great memories, so many great cars. And just want to say you have been a total delight and pleasure to work with during that time period yeah. and no end in sight for where we're, where, where we're headed. I'm sure you feel a lot like I do looking very much forward to getting back together for the first time uh, since the outbreak, which of course, as we know, is going to be July 10th through the 18th. That's our next upcoming event right there in your hometown of Indianapolis. Now that I've said that, take us back. What was your, what was your early connection? I mean, being an Indianapolis resident, the Indianapolis 500 and the Speedway, a big part of your life and your upbringing, but how did you get your feet wet in the early days with this, with all of that? Well, first of all, let me say and back up that, you know, 13 seasons with you by my side, I can't think of anybody that would be better or that I would rather have as my partner up on the booth than, than the professor, as you've come to be known, John Craman. So it's been an absolute, uh, absolute pleasure for me as well. And I learn something every time I sit down next to you, partner. And I, I want to keep going as long as, as long as Dana wants to keep going. Everybody wants to buy a car, so I'm in. Uh, but but your question about getting involved with the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Growing up, I used to listen to it uh, on the radio, uh, listen to qualifying on the radio, uh, you know, sitting out in my yard, had a little uh, Zenith radio or something. And I, I first went, my favorite driver when I was a kid was Mark Donahue, uh, who won the 1972 500. My first race was the, the actually the year after that in 1973, my dad and my grandfather and I went and we sat in turn three. And, and honestly, I don't remember much about that day, but I do remember a lot about that race because it's generally considered one of the most tragic and worst races ever with rain delays and, and crashes. Sweet Savage ended up dying uh, a month or so later. Uh, after after an incredibly fiery crash, uh, Salt Walter, I, I'll never forget him spinning down the uh, the front straightaway. It was just a, a horrible year for the 500. Um, Gordon Johncock ended up winning, but that was that was my first recollection of going to the Indianapolis 500. And then I was there in 1982 for the closest at that time, the closest finish in Speedway history uh, between uh, uh, Rick Mears and Gordon Johncock. And I, I was actually a member of the media that year as a high school senior for my radio station here at Ben Davis High School in Indianapolis. So uh, I got to be out there often and, and got into the garage area a little bit and did some interviews. And, and that was fantastic for a young broadcaster. And then when I went to work at the ABC television station in 1989, uh, then I proceeded to cover the race every May uh, from that point until 1998, I believe. Uh, and then a few years later, uh, graduated on to the track and outs team. I remember several years ago at the 500, I was there in the, the, um, uh, uh, pit side grandstand area. And I saw you there with a microphone and you were doing interviews. Mm -hmm. And of course I had known, we don't talk about it much on the television show, not much time, but I knew that you were a, one of the PA, one of the track announcers for Indianapolis Motor Speedway for a variety of the different uh, uh, races there, including NASCAR, of course, IndyCar, yeah. uh, Formula One, uh, MotoGP. Uh, so you were one of the track announcers. Fill us in on your tenure there on that. Well, that uh, that started in 2007 when I was uh, first asked to be a part of that crew with the legendary Tom Carnegie as the, the long time for more than 50 years, the long time voice of the 500 there at the at the racetrack. Um, and so 300,000 people would come to the race and you would hear Tom Carney describing what's what's happening uh, in in the race. And it's hard uh, on a big public address system like that because it can tend to get noisy from time to time. So you have to be careful with what you say and how you say it and when you say it. So you make sure that that, you know, the majority of people can actually hear what you're saying. But uh, yeah, I, I started with those guys in 2007 and oddly enough uh i want to say a happy birthday to dario franchitti 
uh, has a birthday today uh, on May the 19th. And that was his first of three Indy 500 wins. And I'll never forget it because it was my job that year to be in victory lane and interview the winner, whoever that was going to be. And it was raining cats and dogs. And so we actually, the victory celebration started indoors in the green room and it was packed and everybody was just sopping wet. And then we kind of moved it outdoors for a little, for a little bit. And I've got a picture of uh, Dario and myself doing the interview and we're both just soaking wet, but he's so excited because he just won the Indianapolis 500, the greatest race in the world. Scott, with all of your years hosting Mecham auctions, are there any memories that just really stand out for you? Oh man. Uh, well, I, I, I'm sure JK would agree that, that there are too many Mika moments, as we call them, to, to list here. Uh, most recently, the sale of the Bullet Mustang, that's got to be at the very top in terms of, you know, every way to describe that moment that you could, a piece of uh, film history, automotive history, stuff that just completely transcends movies and cars and is part of Americana. I'll never forget Jerry Lee Lewis playing Great Balls of Fire live on our air, John, uh, a few years ago. Uh, and and his motorcycle, his 1959 Harley, sold for, I think, $250,000 or $350,000, something like that. Um, we've had Richard Petty on. We've had the Stephen Giuliano collection, uh, the kooky car and the Golden Sahara uh, a collection of, of Indy 500 pace cars that I think brought a million dollars a few years ago. So, yeah, and I'm sure I'm leaving something out because there are so many. As I said, it would be you know we ought to do we ought to do a top ten list, J.K. Just you and I get together and and you know put our heads together on top ten of our Mika moments over the years. Scott, what about when it comes to collector and classic cars? What kind of interest do you have? I've I've always kind of been a Corvette guy. Uh, I've I've liked some of the European marks as well. A Porsche 911 is on my uh, is on my bucket list, uh, and a '68 GTX I would love to have at some point. And of course, one of them. Not all of them, but one of them has to be Scott Hoke Blue. So whichever car that is, uh, a mid-year Corvette, JK, in day, a 63 split window in Daytona Blue, I'm okay with that as one of my bucket list cars as well. Over the years, Scott, we've had a lot of fun uh uh, talking about the famed Scott Hope Blue for once and for all, let's finally put it to rest. Describe to all of us what exactly is Scott Hope Blue, your signature color. You know, it's if if you think of the Daytona Blue on a Corvette in '63 or '64, that's a good place to start. It's not quite that deep midnight blue it's maybe a shade or two lighter it's not royal blue uh like you know the indianapolis colts blue it's not quite that bright it's somewhere in between and uh you know it's one of those things where maybe i should call house of color and say i need a number i need a color a color palette a pantone number to say this is what it is uh, because there's a little bit of wiggle room, but not not a lot. And there are some cars that are kind of close. Um, but that that early uh, C2 Daytona Blue is is a good place to start. Well, Scott, be sure to let us know when you get that trademark filed. And uh, in the meantime, thanks for stopping by and hanging out. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. And JK, I don't know if we're going to have to sit six feet apart on the podium when we get back in July doesn't really matter to me because I'm just looking forward to being back uh, and putting a headset on and, and describing cars with you and Bill and Stephen and Katie again. Well, same here, Scott. Once again, uh, as Matt said, thanks so much for calling in, and we reserve the right to have you on in the future. I'll be here. Just let me know. <laughs> thanks, brother. Yep, you too. See you guys. You've been listening to Meekin Presents On The Move, brought to you by State Farm. For more information, visit Meekin.com. And join us again next time as we take you inside the world of muscle and collector cars and more.